we move on to James Coleman. Uh, he has uh, given this rational choice theory. So we look at the introduction uh, to that uh, uh, kind of uh, RCT. Uh, rational theory was uh, generally marginal uh, to mainstream sociological theory, and the Coleman uh, is credited to bring it, uh, let's say, in the, uh, let's say, hot. Uh, in, the, in the mainstream as one of the hard theories in contemporary sociology. In 1989, he established uh, a journal titled as the Rationality and uh, Society. And this whole journal was uh, interdisciplinary and it was devoted to the dissemination of work from a rational choice perspective. So, Coleman tried to publish a lot of material on the subject and also uh, being a member of uh, American Sociological Association and later on being the president of that association, he tried to push this uh, uh, rational choice theory further. So we see that the, uh, for Coleman, rational choice theory provides the paradigm of rational action. When I say paradigm, it simply means a model for, uh, let's say, interpreting the action of the individuals. So, with the RCT, there is a possibility of producing uh, some kind of paradigmatic integration. So, it provides uh, the micro level base for the explanation of uh, macro level phenomena as well. So basically, these are focused on the micro level, let us say, situations, but definitely these could be further extended to macro level situations. So his uh, idea was to develop the rational choice perspective into a systematic and comprehensive perspective. So in his attempt to explain social behavior, ranging from uh, micro-level exchange to normative and legal systems and the establishment of uh, corporate actors at the macro level. So at the micro level might be, let's say, two persons in interaction and then moving on to uh, interaction, let's say, between groups uh, and then between collectivities uh, and when we talk about collectivities, the interaction between or amongst the collectivities, that might be more uh, reflective of the division of labor, that might be more reflective of the bigger businesses, bigger corporations, and that uh, contains these corporate actors. Actors here does not necessarily mean the individual, uh, let's say, persons. Actors could be an organization corporate, let's say, actor, one actor, the other actor, uh, using it as an entity. So the structures uh, and the normative patterns, uh, wherever we look at this exchange and this uh, uh, choice, we uh, always come across, uh, let's say, norms of the uh, people, norms which govern the patterns of the behavior, plus various strategies developed for their enforcement is called social environment. So norms are there, the norms are there to be enforced and who enforces that? Is there a panchayat who enforces those norms? Or is there, let's say, another institution? Uh, are there, uh, let's say, prosecutors? Are there courts to adjudicate all these kind of uh, uh, let's say, situations where the individuals or the entities or the groups are in conflict. Now, we might consider the whole of this setup as the social environment. Now, this social environment uh, regulates the way particular exchange tra transactions are developed, these are continued, and these are, let's say, executed. So, macro level social changes always uh, require explanations at individual le level. Actors have a single principle of action 
that of acting so as to maximize the realization of their interests. So we see that uh, individuals are part of this environment and this uh, uh, environment is the outcome of the variety of rational choice decisions made by them earlier. So people try to pursue their individual interests and goals and they are dependent on uh, the resources of others as well. Others could be within the family, others could be between the groups, others could be between the collectivities. And since there is some kind of interdependence, we look at the exchange uh, established when parties control extra resources. If a person has or a party has extra resource, that could be exchanged for something which, is, uh, which might be needed for this individual. So it involves giving up on which party has control, giving up on which part. I mean, a person might be having the money, for example, and he has control on it. And he is trying to give this money in exchange for the purchase of something. So the, the money on which the person had control is being given to the seller. And who had a control on the commodity which this person is trying to get in exchange. So we see that that exchange uh, takes place. So people have multiple interests but limited resources or then this uh, requires a choice dilemma and then it might make uh, let's say tensions and have to make rational choices. Resources uske paas itne hai hain. Cheez shah ziyada chahiye then a person might have to uh, rank order the let's say needs and try to uh, let's say purchase them and uh, uh, according to one's interests and that is how the exchange continues so individuals rational actions can also lead to irrational outcomes we see that it is not necessary that every time the rational action uh, results in the expected kind of behavior if it is not, that it might be expected tha ke uska rational action, rational result hoga, lekin nahi hua. So then one might say it is irrational. So it could happen because of the lack of information, lack of knowledge. Therefore, we might say that the rational actions might be dependent uh, uh, on the outcomes of the actions of others, which actors may be unaware. So we don't know how the other party is going to behave. We may not have enough information. Therefore, mera uh, rational action jo hai, it uh, may not give me the results. It might result in irrational kind of, well, let's say, uh, outcomes and thereby, this action ko mein rational tha, that becomes irrational.